Welcome to the Wellesley Evening Weekend Lecture Series. I think this is number three. Our last one was canceled due to the Super Bowl. But next this October or September, somewhere around there, David Becker of Sweet Basil and Juniper will be joining us. So stay tuned. Um, but tonight, the snowstorm didn't happen, so we all get to be here and thank you all for coming. I'd also like to first thank the library and the Wellesley Hills Junior Women's Club who helps us sponsor. Um, so since 1995, Ted Reinstein, am I saying that right, I hope? I say Stein. You can say Stein. <laughs> I say tomato. It's all good, you exactly. Say tomato. <laughs> uh, wait, so wait, which way do you say it now? Now I'm mixed up what I did. Stein. Stein. Okay. Yeah. Since 1995, Ted Reinstein has been a reporter for Boston's WCB, WCBB TV's Chronicle the nation's longest running locally produced nightly news magazine. He also provides reports and commentary on Sunday mornings for the station's political roundtable show on the record. Ted has been a member of the WCVB editorial board since 2010. Um, elsewhere in television, he's hosted the premiere season of the Discovery Channel's Popular Mechanics, hosted a special on America's Lighthouse for HGTV, and for the Travel Channel photo adventure series Freeze Frame, he explored Hawaii's volcanoes, the caves of Puerto Rico, and the South Pacific island of Tahiti. I think I liked all that because they're all warm and I don't <laughs> know. Um, in 2002, he was part of Chronicle's team that received a prestigious National DuPont Columbia Broadcast Journalism Award for Chronicle's coverage of Boston's Big Dig project. And in 2010, he was one of five national finalist in the Washington Post Great American Pundit Opinion Writing Competition. He has three books um, that you get to purchase afterwards. The first one, New England Notebooks, One Reporter, Six States, Uncommon Stories, was released in May of 2013, and the book recounts many of Ted's favorite people and stories from his travels all around New England. A National Geographic Traveler named it one of its best picks, and it's now in its second printing. In April 2016, um, the second book, Wicked Pissed, New England's Most Famous Feuds. Um, I know, I feel like I'm swearing, but it's okay, because it's the title of the book. It's okay, yeah. I'm not good at that. Um, and his newest book, written in collaboration with his wife, Anne Marie, is New England's General Stores Exploring an American Classic. So welcome, we are so glad to have you here as part of our series. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, and all I can say is, thank goodness this is tonight and not last night. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. This is, I wasn't here for the second book, but uh, were any of you here when I visited last with my first book, New England Notebook? A couple of you. Not enough, but um, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. You know, the best part of, of being here tonight is that you know, sometimes two or three nights a week, uh, I travel around uh, speaking, and uh, frequently quite a bit further afield than Wellesley. So I work in Needham, and I live a little further down the road in Holliston. So 10 minutes to get here, another 15, 20 minutes to get home, I, I could do this every night. So <laughs> thank you for that, too. Uh, so although this is the cover of my, my first book, what, I, what I'd like to do tonight is I put together kind of a, a, a blend of a number of things. So this is not really talking about one book, but this is rather sharing with you, uh, which was really a lot of fun to put together because it gives me an opportunity, it gave me an opportunity to kind of go back through uh, some of my favorite people and places and stories that I've covered over 20 plus years of reporting all around New England. And first up makes complete sense because I have often been asked if I have a favorite story. Now, if there is one single story over the scores of stories that I've done in almost 25 years uh, that is my favorite, right? And I'm always delighted to be able to say that, yes, not only do I have a favorite story of all time, favorite story ever, but I can sum it up with a four-letter word. It's okay. It's okay. 
Fred. F R E D. Anybody ever heard of Fred Tuttle? Hmm? Yeah? A couple in the back? I think there's a couple of very loyal Chronicle viewers back there. Um, <laughs> you know, a couple. That's all right, because I'm going to tell you all about them. But, you know, the funny thing is, <clears throat> if we were talking tonight in Montpelier or Rutland or Enosburg Falls, Vermont, and I said, well, it would be silly to say anybody heard of Fred Tuttle, because it would be, in effect, like asking anybody ever heard of all of our favorite uncle. Because Fred Tuttle is, by now, pretty much regarded universally in Vermont as, uh, oh, there you are, uh, Vermont's, Vermont's most beloved folk hero. Now, he was also known, I think would be regarded, as uh, Vermont's most famous former dairy farmer. That may not sound like a whole hell of a lot in Wellesley, but uh, in a state that counted more cows than people until just 1962, it's kind of a big deal. But for our purposes and the purposes of what made Fred my most favorite story of all time, he is also, I've always contended, America's most unlikely movie star. He doesn't look like a movie star? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess, you know, maybe if he was in full makeup and full costume, which in effect he is because he never wore anything other than really what he wore. I never ever, I don't know if anybody ever, once he was past the age of 30, saw Fred Tuttle in anything other than his trademark Carter's blue jean coveralls. Um, I'm taking it in this day in, in um, Tunbridge, Vermont, the temperature may have dipped below 40 degrees or so. And, Maybe that's when Fred threw on that little quilted maroon jacket. But I saw Fred in the depths of freezing cold Vermont winters and never saw him with gloves on or any kind of a scarf or anything warmer than that maroon jacket. Uh, the hat was ubiquitous. I think that the hat that said Fred, I think for Fred that represented a certain amount of um, peace of mind. Remember those, uh, I'm dating myself, but remember, I can remember as a kid, you know, remember those motel keys that said on them, if lost, just drop in a mailbox, right? <laughs> right? And so I think that's what the hat represented for Fred. I think it gave him the peace of mind that he could forget his hat anywhere. And it would, everybody would know it was Fred's hat. Um, but you're wondering what makes him a former movie star. Well, you know, whether it's Tunbridge, Vermont, or Hollywood, California, when it comes to films, showbiz, it's who you know. Right. And so it was for Fred Herman Tuttle. Um, it was his neighbor, John O'Brien, that led Fred into a life of the silver screen. Um, John O'Brien is a fascinating guy all by himself. Uh, he grew up next door to Fred. He grew up next door to Fred. The O'Briens ran a sheep farm in Tunbridge that abutted the Tuttle dairy farm. And uh, John worked for Fred from the time he was a little kid. Before he could work for him, Fred would have him over anytime he wanted and prop him up between his legs on the tractor. Later on, during summers home from college, John would work for Fred for real on the dairy farm. And he was a bright guy, went off to college, went to Harvard. And he did not major in what his passion was at Harvard. But as soon as he graduated, he began to focus on what his passion was, which is filmmaking. But it is a very unique, particular kind of filmmaking. Uh, he calls it community cinema, which sounds a lot like community theater, which is really the exact same thing. I've never heard of anybody else doing it uh, with cinema, though, and not theater. And John would take a, a real life situation somewhere that he heard about or read about that was going on. Could be like some sort of. Uh, um, tussle with folks in a town with a, with, a, with a corporation or something, and John would come in and talk to people and meet them and get their story. He was a wonderful journalist, too. And then he would craft a screenplay around this, and he would use real people who were living this story to tell this in a film. But he never told a story using real people he knew who were telling their own story more effectively or more famously than he did with his neighbor, Fred. So John graduated from Harvard came back to Tunbridge to work his mom's sheep farm. And when he came back, Fred was now in his mid-70s, and he was in diminished circumstances. He was not the man that John 
had left and remembered five, six years earlier when he'd been around more, uh, Fred's health had gone downhill a bit. Uh, he had a bunch of problems, really. He had, uh, oh, he had terrible eyes, terrible hearing. He had a balky heart. He had uh, arthritis in both hips. He had bad knees. Other than that, he was an Adonis. <laughs> but um, and he couldn't farm anymore. That's, I'm carrying the lead there. He couldn't farm anymore because of all these health problems. Um, he also had his own 92-year-old dad living with him who had his own health problems. I don't think that helped so much. Uh, so he couldn't afford to keep up his barn anymore. It started falling apart. And he couldn't farm. And it broke his heart. Had to sell off his beloved herd of Jersey cows. Said it broke his heart. It said it, he said it was like selling off his own kids. But that's the way it was. That's where he was at. And John came back and took all this in and uh, realized that, well, my friend Fred, well, needs money. He needs a job. And John realized that he was not really in a position to give his neighbor Fred a job. But he was in a position to tell Fred's story. And so he set to work crafting a story about his neighbor Fred, a broken down Vermont dairy farmer with a broken down barn who couldn't farm anymore. Very proud, right? This iconic American farmer and can't do the one thing that he is skilled and experienced and trained and able to do, which is farm. Couldn't do it. Didn't want to take any help. Wanted a job to pay off his bills and afford his health care and so forth. Didn't know what the hell that job could be. So John crafted this movie, and he convinced his neighbor Fred to star in it as himself. And in the movie, he thinks of a job that would be perfect for Fred in his circumstances. Because Fred, after all, needs a job that pays pretty well, right? We've established he had all these expenses, notably health. And he needed a job that didn't require any formal education. Fred had dropped out of seventh grade. And he needed a job that uh, didn't require any heavy lifting. Fred wasn't capable of that. And more than anything, he needed a job that really came with blue chip health care. So John thought of the perfect job. He figured all Fred has to do is get elected to Congress. Not a lot of heavy lifting lately. I think I can say that in the most bipartisan way. And so he does. Fred Tuttle, as himself, runs for Congress. By the way, I told you John's a bright guy. He thought of, so Fred Tuttle, his neighbor, broken down dairy farmer, running for Congress. John thought of the most, I don't know how many of you are kind of political nuts. I, I love politics. And he thought of, in the movie, of Fred Tuttle running for Congress, the best political slogan I've ever heard. So broken down Vermont dairy farmer running for Congress. His, slogan, his campaign slogan was, I've spent my whole life in the barn. Now I just want to spend a little time in the house. <laughs> Is that beautiful? Somebody's got to use that someday, for real. So he does. He runs for Congress. And in the movie, he wins. Yeah. Mr. Tuttle goes to Washington. And it was a hit. The movie was a hit. Now, you may not remember this. It wasn't, look, it wasn't like it got pressed like Titanic. But it was an independent hit. It played everywhere. I mean, everywhere. It played down, you know, played at the Kendall in Cambridge. It was a hit, highest grossing film in Vermont state history. And it made Fred Tuttle a folk hero. <laughs> you may not recall. There was a little show called Leno. Um, but you may not recall, in the early 90s, this was like the feel-good story of the year. Fred Tuttle was everywhere. He was everywhere. Fred Herman Tuttle tooling around Beverly Hills. How about that? So it was great. It was great. And I did at least two or three stories on Fred Tuttle and the movie. I went up the very first time I met Fred, drove up to Tunbridge, and we met Fred in the center of town, and then we, we walked up a little bit into some higher pasture land. And uh, first question I ever asked Fred, I said, Fred, has your wife, Dottie, seen the movie yet? And he said, no. I said, is she going to? He said, I doubt it. She says she sees enough of me already. 
Uh, but the movie was a hit. I did several stories on Fred. So it's great. And things kind of die down for a little bit. And uh, fast forward now, I was 95. Fast forward now three years, 1998. In what has to be considered one of the most, let's see, how I always thought of it as art imitating life, imitating art. Because what happens is, the buzz of the movie has started to die down a little, right? I mean, that happens. And um, John O'Brien, especially, uh, would like to sort of revive some of the excitement about the movie, but they're trying to figure out how to do that. They made the movie on a shoestring budget, half a shoestring from one shoe, $650,000. That is less by about almost $400,000 than what a Hollywood feature film spends on catering in one week. So they made it on a shoestring, and needless to say, they had no money three years later to sort of do any PR around the movie again. They couldn't re-release it. You know, if you're a Hollywood feature film, you can re-release the commemorative edition, the anniversary, you know, with the director's cut, with previously unseen footage. Not an option for these guys. So they were trying to think what to do. Well, it's 1998, an even-numbered year, an election year. You might see where this is going. So they had a diabolically brilliant idea. They sat around, and John sat up bolt upright one day, he said, at his house. And he thought, wait a minute. We just spent three years, essentially, in the movie and the promo promotion afterward, running Fred like in fantasy for Congress. Well, here in Vermont, the state senior senator, Democrat Patrick Leahy, is up for re-election. Why don't we run Fred for real? No, because they, they both liked Pat Leahy very much. So it wasn't like they wanted to beat Pat Leahy. They just thought, you know, we'll say he's running against him as the Republican. Nobody else is. And then, um, and then you know, we'll get all kinds of publicity, and it'll be great. Fred can, you know, didn't, wasn't going to leave his Barker lounger in Tunbridge. It wasn't like they had the campaign or anything. And it was great. And they put the plan into effect. They put the plan into effect. They took out nomination papers, and they said, we are running against Pat Leahy. And sure enough, I went back up, and they got all kinds of publicity. And this was great for about a month and a half. And then, lo and behold, out of the woods comes a primary opponent for Fred. This was not foreseen. This was not welcome. Not because they like thought, oh, now we have to beat a primary opponent. They weren't going to actually campaign. <laughs> Fred wasn't going to get out of the Barker lounger. <laughs> now they have to actually campaign. So they did. Jack McMullen, I'm just going to pick up a book that I'm going to read something from you, too. Jack McMullen is a, um, was a retired Massachusetts businessman from the Berkshires. And he had moved over the line to Brattleboro, Vermont in 1998, or rather just before whatever the like, filing deadline was to, to move and still be able to establish residency. Um, because I think Jack thought that he would establish some sort of a political beachhead you know, in southern Vermont and then move on in his quest for higher office in Vermont. And then Jack McMullen meets Fred Tuttle. And Fred Tuttle meets Jack McMullen. And they were both quite surprised at this unexpected happenstance. Well, it's a political campaign, and there are two primary opponents, so they had to have a debate. <laughs> <laughs> if you were Fred Tuttle's campaign manager, the one thing you would not want to do is have to have a debate. Fred is a love, I loved Fred. But Fred, let me put it this way, you remember our late, great, wonderful Boston Mayor, Tom Menino. Tom is a friend of mine. And um, he'd be the first to tell you, as he would put it so well and immortally, I'm not a fancy talker. Well, Tom Menino sounds like Winston Churchill compared to <laughs> Fred Tuttle. Fred Tuttle, it was said that when Fred Tuttle said his name, it sounded like what he was saying was, 
I'm a furry turtle. <laughs> it kind of came out that way. Hi, I'm a furry turtle. So, but they had to have a debate. They had to have a debate. So they did. They met, they met in October 1998 in Burlington, Vermont, at the offices of Vermont Public Radio. Now, I have already admitted to the fact that um, I am a bit of a political junkie. And I love especially, specifically, political debates. I love watching them, covering them. I love reading about them. I like reading transcripts of them. It's pathetic, I know. But, uh, but there it is. They had an exchange in this debate that is now my favorite exchange in any debate. I, look, I haven't read through all of Lincoln Douglas. But this is my favorite exchange I've ever read, heard, or seen live in a political debate. I want to read it to you because I think that it's better read than described. Um, it's only three lines. This is the actual verbatim exchange on <laughs> October 30th, 1998 at VPR in Burlington, Vermont. Fred, this is a milk production question, Jack. How many teats does a Holstein have and how many teats does a Jersey have? <laughs> McMullen, how many what, Fred? <laughs> Fred, teats, Jack, teats. How many teats does a damn cow have? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know, like I said, we're in Wellesley, not Wisconsin. But nonetheless, I'd be willing to bet that a majority of us in this room know that the answer to the question of how many teats does a cow have, whether it's a Jersey, a Holstein, a Belt, a Garraway, or from Mars, is whatever the breed is foa. Doesn't vary. Um, Jack McMullen did not know that. If you are running for the US Senate from the state of Vermont, and you don't know how many teats a cow has, that's like running for the mayor of Detroit and not knowing how many wheels a car has, OK? <laughs> it ain't going to work. And it didn't work. And on November 6th, 1998, Fred Herman Tuttle defeated Jack McMullen <laughs> and became the official Republican nominee for the United States Senate. <laughs> then it got weirder. So <laughs> at this point, at this point, the Vermont State Republican Party is beside itself because they suddenly realize that in Fred Tuttle, folk hero, movie star, they have a candidate, unlike McMullen, who was unknown, who has the same name recognition as Pat Leahy. They were giddy. That lasted about a week. <laughs> At Fred's introductory press conference, his rollout as the official Republican nominee, he was asked by a reporter, what do you think about your Democratic opponent, Pat Leahy? And Fred said, I love Leahy. I'm sure he's going to win. <laughs> To which he followed, but look, if you want to see me go to Washington, why don't you rent my movie? So at this point, the Vermont State Republican Party was starting to have somewhat second thoughts. I was the one who was actually giddy. I'm like watching this, and it's like, as a reporter, this is like, Fred's are like the gift that just keeps on giving. You just wait for the next installment of the Fred Tuttle story. So I went to my boss and I said, do you see what is going on with Fred Tuttle? And he said, yeah. I said, I think I should go up and spend a couple of days on the campaign trail. What do you think? And he said, how soon can you get up there? I said, how about tomorrow? 24 hours later, I was knocking on the side door. They don't answer the front door. I was knocking on the side door of the Tuttles in Tunbridge, Vermont. And Dottie Tuttle, Fred's, um, Fred's wife, second wife, Dottie, trying to think how to describe, how to describe Dottie. Dottie Tuttle, salt of the earth, salt of the earth, salty vocabulary. Um, so, so I said to Dottie, Dottie, what is going on with this Senate thing? And she said, first words out of her mouth. Well, I ain't voting for him. That's for goddamn sure. <laughs> she actually added another descriptor in there, but I, I can't.
<laughs> I said, what, the, what do you mean? He's your husband. She said, he's my husband. He's not qualified. So we nonetheless went off to the first campaign event of the day. And it was at a little uh, elementary school in Tunbridge. And it was sixth grade class, 20, 20 21 kids. And sixth grade class, so they were all like uh, 11 years old, 11, 12 years old. And the teacher of the class had called me the day before, and she had said, you know, when you guys are coming up, I think you should have your camera in the class when Fred walks in. I think it'll be a good idea. And I said to myself, you know, everybody's a director. Uh, but when I got there, I realized why she thought that would be a good idea, and it was. Um, Every single kid, boy and girl, including the teacher, all in this kind of homage to their now famous neighbor, all of them were wearing Fred's trademark blue jean coveralls. And the thing is, you gotta picture, you gotta picture this, right? So these kids are like this big, and they're wearing their parents or their dads or who's ever coveralls, right? So in able to walk around, it looked like a class of headless kids. Because no, because to walk around, what they were doing was they were holding up the shoulder strap so their head was down here and they were like walking around. Funniest thing I've ever seen, but cutest thing I've ever seen. I have long said it might be the cutest shot that we've ever had for Chronicle because Fred walked in, had no idea. He walked in and did just that. He walked in and he took it in and he took off his hat and he rubbed his stubbly chin and he said, well, look at that, by Jesus. And he sat down, and he had a, uh, a Q&A session, had a Q&A session with the kids, and they asked him a lot of tough questions. They asked him um, what was his favorite pizza topping, and what kind of ice cream he liked, and I felt like, you know, big shot reporter that I was, like I had to ask an actual political question. So I, uh, I did, I raised my hand, and I said, uh, I said, Fred, John, I said, um, how much money have you guys spent on your campaign so far? And Fred turned to John and he said, John, what would you say? About 25 bucks? <laughs> About 25 bucks, I'd say. So the kids all went out. Kids all went out to recess. And Fred and I pulled up a couple of those little desks. Let me tell you something. I know it's been a while. Do we have any, do we have any elementary school teachers here? Yeah? So you know. Um, you forget how low those little desks. <laughs> I, I Drag, they're like step stools. So, uh, so we had to pull a couple of chairs over, actually. But uh, so we had our interview with the big candidate. And uh, I said to Fred, I said, Fred, you know, I'm no political expert, but I've read a lot of American political history. And I can tell you, one of the things that I thought about driving up here is how much of American political history, particularly as it relates to campaigns and elections and their outcomes, had completely unforeseen circumstances. We've seen that recently. And I said, uh, I said, I said uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So never mind that this is some kind of joke. I said, you're on the, battle. You're on the ballot, my friend. You don't know what's going to happen. Pat Leahy doesn't know what's going to happen. I said, you tell me, kidding aside. Day after the election, you've won. What happens? What happens with your life? He rubbed the stubbly chin again and he said, well, first thing my wife, she'll divorce me right off quick. <laughs> well, in the end, in the end, Fred did not put Dotty Tuttle through any such ordeal. In the end, in the end, actually right before the end, Fred did something that has never been done in the annals of American senatorial campaign politics. Fred officially endorsed his opponent, Pat Leahy. <laughs> he said, I'm a man of my word. He said, I told you, I like Leahy. So he also, in doing so, completely finished off any future with the Vermont State Republican Party. But <laughs> despite endorsing his opponent on election day, November 6th, 1998, Fred Tuttle got 22% of the vote. <laughs> And Pat Leahy, Pat Leahy, who has never lost a political race, will tell you, as he told me to this day, it's the biggest scare he ever got. <laughs> and right before, right before, as soon as Fred 
had, had endorsed Leahy, the wonderful thing was, you know, Vermonters like to think of themselves as kind of flinty and frugal people. So Pat Leahy immediately suspended his campaign so as not to spend another nickel. And now with this time they had, they didn't have to debate, they didn't have to campaign, he invited Fred to use this time to drive around the state and visit schools, talk to school kids. And Fred accepted on one condition. He said, Pat, I'll do it, but you have to drive. <laughs> None of these fancy aids. You drive the car. And Pat had to agree. Now, the funny thing is, there are people all around Vermont who remember this like it was yesterday for an interesting reason. So at this point, they're driving around the state, right? And Fred is 76 years old. How can I put this delicately? He needed to stop frequently. <laughs> whether or not there were actual facilities. And it's just the two of them driving. So there are people to this day who recall driving up or down Route 7 or 89 or Route 100 in Vermont and driving and saying, like, what the? This Pat Leahy standing beside the car. Oh my God, that's Fred Toto back there. So there are people, it was like Pat and Fred's excellent adventure. <laughs> and on election day, he did. He beat his friend. He beat his friend, Fred Tuttle. And on election night, as soon as the polls had closed, about 8 o'clock, Pat called Fred to congratulate him. And Dottie Tuttle answered the phone. And she said, Pat, he's sound asleep, and I ain't waking him. There is no one in America who would have spoken quite that way to the then chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, but <laughs> that's Dottie Tuttle. I told you. Speaks her mind. So he called back bright and early the next morning, early, farmer's time early, 5 a.m., and he got Fred. And he said, Fred, good morning, pal. He said, uh, I just want to congratulate you. Boy, we had some fun, didn't we? And Fred said, Pat, I'm so glad you won. And he said, why? He said, because. Had a dream last night that I won, and I've been hiding out in the barn shaking so no one would find me. <laughs> well, you know, I could continue to describe Fred, but nobody describes Fred better than his friend Pat Leahy. So let me finish with something Pat Leahy related to me when we spoke about Fred. This is Pat Leahy. One night, Fred and I sat up till almost midnight talking. He told me his biggest regret was quitting school. He loved children. He always told them not to do what he had done, stay in school. I asked Leahy what he thinks the essence of Fred's unique appeal was. Well, Vermonters heard him, and they knew he was authentic as they come. What you saw and heard was who he was and what you got. There was no guile whatsoever. He was nice. He was warm. There's a pause on the other end of the line. The easy, self-assured voice of the nation's second most senior senator and chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee trails off for a moment. At some point before he died, Leahy says, he told me that the last years of his life, riding around the state, meeting school kids, were the happiest years of his whole life. In 2003, at the age of 84, Fred Tuttle passed away at his home in Tunbridge, Vermont. And by Jesus, he was a good one. That's Fred Tuttle. Now, you know, I said that I talked to you a little bit tonight about and share with you some of my favorite people and favorite places. This next story I want to share with you briefly is special to me because it not only encompasses one of my favorite places, but one of my favorite people as well. Um, New Bedford, Mass, is, I mean, I grew up on the water too. So there are, you know, kind of water, harbor towns, or feel sort of kindred to me. I grew up in Winthrop, or as I like to refer to it, the charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27L. Um, <laughs> it was a noisy childhood. But um, I also, in many of my stories I've done, I'm attracted to underdogs, whether they are people who are overcoming difficulties and challenges, or whether they're towns and cities like New Bedford. Mill towns, harbor towns that have had to reinvent themselves, find new ways to recover lost prosperity, find jobs for people, 
I love those towns. I love those towns. And New Bedford is all that. Um, and there is a woman I met about 20 years ago who really is the poster child in many ways for that spirit of New Bedford. Because you know, New Bedford has been knocked down. Some would say it's still down. Some would say it's constantly on its way to fight back. And that's been kind of her as well. Lynn Donahue grew up in New Bedford. I'm not going to go through. I do a whole talk about Lynn Donahue, but I'm not going to. So I won't go through all the details of her life. Let me just say that she had an unimaginably um, difficult childhood, one of six kids alcoholic, physically abusive father, single mom, basically, working sometimes three jobs to try to put food on the table for these kids. And it was an awful childhood. She left home at 16, fell in with the wrong crowd. She'll tell you herself, she can't believe many days that she's still here. She counted more kids that she knew that are dead than are still alive. But nonetheless, you know, it's always amazed me some of the times that people who are able to get themselves back in the column of the living and the still trudging on, it's amazing to me sometimes what it is that can do that for somebody. For some people, it's, it's, it's love, finding somebody. Sometimes for someone else, it's, it's something different. But for Lynn Donahue, of all things, it was an ad in a newspaper when there were ads in newspapers. I hope we don't have to say ultimately when there were newspapers. But it was an ad in the newspaper. So this is back in the 70s. And this is the period of Title IX, right? The nation finally overdue, realizing that the field is not level when it comes to women and when it comes to everything about what women do in terms of seeking employment, in terms of sports. And this particular ad was about trying to redress the huge inequity and imbalance that existed in the building trades, right? of which there were basically no women. So it was looking for women who were interested in a stipend to get trained in some of the building trades. And she jumped. And she spent. Eight months driving, tending bars so she could put gas in this beat up car, and driving to a local community college three nights a week. And she learned how to be a mason, a bricklayer. And she got a job. She went to the union office in New Bedford. She said, I have my certificate here as a bricklayer. And the guy laughed. And that was at 9.30 in the morning. At 5 o'clock. He realized that this lady sitting opposite him in this room apparently wasn't leaving. And she said, no, I'm not leaving. I have my certificate here. And I'd like to go out on a job. So finally, because the guy had to go home and lock the place up, he gave her the info for a job site the next morning in Fall River. And she went. You know. <laughs> Uh, it was not, these guys in this job site had never seen a woman coming to work at what they did, ever, never. None of them had. But there she was. Uh, and it, was, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. Uh, she would routinely, at lunchtime, you know, trudge off alone and uh, open her lunch pail only to find that it had been dumped out and there was a dead bird inside. Um, you know, guys. And, um, you know, terrible things said. Anyway, the worst was that uh, uh, several weeks in, she was, uh, she fell. She fell 16 feet from a piece of unsecured scaffolding and uh, got pretty beat up. Uh, you know, they may have thought that was it, but uh, they didn't know Lindanio. So she came back. The doctor said, you've got. Uh, she broke several bones in her leg, and uh, she broke her elbow and cracked a rib. They said, look, uh, you need to be off your feet for about six weeks. Six days later, she came back. 
And to hear some of these guys who were on that job site, I've spoken to one, and tell it, they said, it was like something out of Rocky. They said, first of all, they couldn't believe she was back. Then they couldn't believe she was walking back and getting up on the scaffolding again. And they watched her, and she went back to work. And they never, ever bothered her again. Rather, they watched her become one of the best bricklayers they'd ever seen. In short order, she became the first full card-carrying member anywhere in America of the Bricklayers Union. And she was such an accomplished mason that the local building trade agent recommended her when that same Title IX program was now looking for five select women around America who were in the building trades now, but who wanted to get a very low interest loan to start their own contracting business. Because there was not a single construction company in America that was headed at that point by a woman. And she jumped at it. And she did really well. In fact, her company, Argus Construction, in New Bedford, became one of the most successful construction businesses in southeastern Massachusetts. And this is where the Lynn Donahue story goes from a story about one woman fighting back to one woman's incredible capacity for grace. Because here's what happens. Because her construction company is doing so well, she's bidding so well and getting so many jobs that scores of the same guys that had originally made her life a living hell were forced to come to her and ask for a job, Mrs. Donahue. And you know what she said to each one of them? Two words, you're hired. And she became the best boss. There are guys all over southeastern Massachusetts today, Fairhaven, Marion, Somerset, Swansea, I've spoken to them, who will tell you, I would walk through a wall for little Linny Donahue. They loved this woman. She became the best boss they ever had. She knew their kids' names. She knew when their kids' birthdays were. She delivered the check to them personally every week, her paycheck, and she thanked them personally for their hard work. But her work wasn't done. She felt that she wanted to share her story, and she wanted to give something back. So she started a nonprofit organization called Brick by Brick, which to this day is doing its wonderful work still. And it borrows a wonderful idea from the building trades, which was her idea, which is to mentor at-risk kids in New Bedford and Fall River and actually help them design a builder's blueprint for how to go about and build a better life. It's still going on today. She also, at the same time, while she was doing that, there's a street in the rehabbed Whaling District in New Bedford that Lynn did, and she wrote her autobiography, Brick by Brick. But she still wasn't done. She had never finished high school, so about 16 years ago, she decided she'd go back and finish high school. She still wasn't done. She decided she'd like to go to college. She did. She still wasn't done. Today, having got her doctorate, Lynn Donahue is Dr. Lynn Donahue. And she travels the world, speaking in countries all over the world on women's empowerment. Just a little bricklayer from New Bedford. You know, I said I'd talk about one of my favorite places. This is it. Um, this is one of my very favorite places in all of New England, other than Wellesley. Um, anybody know where this is? Oh my God, who said that? It's because you've been there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Some, it, I don't get that every night. Um, Pemaquid Point. This is Pemaquid Point. Now, you know, that's what you see. Pemaquid sits. Pemaquid sits at the end of one of those narrow, narrow finger peninsulas, you know, that jut out off the coast of Maine. I'm going to share with you, speaking of the coast of Maine, my favorite New England factoid. You don't have to thank me now, but you can share this later and impress people. Um, this is my favorite factoid about New England. So, you know, imagine that ragged and rocky coast of Maine, right, as it threads its way 
all up the coast, and you've got all those little finger peninsulas sticking out, and all those little islands and inlets. You know, if you fly north, down east, from Boston to, say, Eastport, Chias, you know, up there, across the water, right? It's only about 225 miles. It's not that far. But that narrow, ragged, and rocky coast of Maine that goes and meanders in and out, in and out, in and out, that'll take you eight and a half hours to navigate. But even more, this is the factoid. If you could somehow magically straighten out that ragged and rocky coast of Maine, you know, like a balled up piece of twine, you know, bang, and you could straighten it out, you know what you get? 3,000 miles. The same Boston to LA, 3,000 miles. And Pemaquid sits at the end, right at the end of one of those finger peninsulas. Mid coast Maine, it's in Bristol, Maine. If you drive up to mid coast, like Brunswick area, and you bang a right, and you drive south for about I don't know, 45 minutes you will drive right up to this, the keeper's house, the lighthouse. Now, the lighthouse, and I'm sure my friend here is going to agree, this is not what makes it our favorite place. This is not what you see when you drive up. In fact, that lighthouse, does that look vaguely familiar? It should. It's a very, very common, in fact, it was a very common uh, lighthouse design of the mid 19th century into the early 20th century, lots of lighthouses look very much like that, right? Nobska, the Nubbel. In fact, if you add about 70 feet to that, you've got Boston Light, right? So it's very familiar. It's not the lighthouse that people, I think, find so fascinating about Pemaquid. We're getting warm, we're getting close. You get behind the lighthouse now, on the water side, you've got these incredible striated rocks, right? that run down to the water. A lot of people like to take, like my friend Vera Kaufman, wonderful landscape photographer who took this picture. Get some wonderful pictures in the reflecting pools. Um, it's impressive. It's impressive. I've never seen the, these kind of striated rocks that run for hundreds of feet. Um, and it's, it's incredible in all four seasons of the year. So it is what's behind the lighthouse that for me makes Pemaquid point what I see in my mind's eye when I think about that ragged and rocky coast of Maine. You s I see Pemaquid. I see Pemaquid. And it has this wonderful thing about it, the way it forms this kind of horseshoe in Muscongas Bay. You can't see, when you are down at this point on the water, you can't see around there to the north, and you can't see around to the south. So you just see that view. You see the horizon out. Ahead of you, next stop, coast of Europe. Now, when I wrote the chapter on Maine in my first book, I had to consult my favorite Mainologist, Peter Mahegan. Anybody remember Peter? Peter was a longtime reporter for Chronicle and anchor and uh, a mentor of mine, really, at Chronicle. And Peter and I loved to talk. Uh, well, there were two things, basically, that Peter and I talked about around the office at Chronicle. One was uh, the state of the Red Sox. Well, three things, politics, but that was a given. And, uh, and the other was Maine. We love to talk about Maine. You may recall, those of you who know Peter, remember Peter. Peter drove his trademark Chevy uh, all over the state of Maine, right? And uh, <clears throat> in his On the Road series, and Peter knew Maine. Well, I would say there are Mainers who would probably defer to Peter sometimes when it comes to things about Maine. Um, and the one thing Peter and I love to talk about, you know, Mainers, do we have any Mainers here tonight? We do. Where are you from? Augusta. Augusta, over in the central. And you? Lewiston, Auburn. Good old LA. I, was, I did a story up there again. My brother lived there for a little while. Yes, he was the only rabbi for miles. And, <laughs> and he lived in LA. Uh, so the one thing, and I, I'm sure my friends from Maine will not disagree with me, the one idiosyncrasy that we love to talk about when it comes to Mainers is that Mainers, by and large, you tell me if, if I'm wrong, but by and large, a lot of Mainers don't like to talk so much right away to people from away. <laughs> Flatlanders, right? Yes, people from away, right. So Peter, I love that because Peter had a whole, so he could have published a book, How to Speak to Mainers, because he, he thought he had it down. 
But um, so he was, he was a wonderful resource for me. And I remember when I talked to him and he told me about his friend at, uh, at Pemaquid. But when we were getting off the phone, this is about six years ago, right before the, my first book came out. And as we're getting off the phone, I said, hey, Pete, you know what? I, ne I don't think I've ever asked you. What's your favorite main anecdote? Hands down, what's your favorite main anecdote? He said, ah, he didn't like to be put on the spot ever. He said, I don't know, Trudy. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, this just happened a couple of weeks ago. So this is about six and a half years ago. This was Peter's last on the road that he had come back to do. And he said, uh, so he related this story. So he had a good friend in Cundy's Harbor, Maine. Now, Cundy's, you know Cundy's? OK, Cundy's is a classic little lobster inlet, right? It is classic. And he had a good friend in Cundy's. And whenever he was in or around the area, he would drop in on his friend in Cundy's. And they would go out and lobster a half hour or so. And then they would come back in. And they would thaw out over an adult beverage or two or three. And so on this one particular trip, he said that he happened to be nearby to Cundy's. So we decided to drop by. So he said he drove up, and he pointed the Chevy down to the dock. And he said he saw the guy's son throwing some traps up on the dock. But he didn't see his dad, Pete's friend. And he thought, oh, no. So he said Pete got, got out, and he walked up to the guy's son. And he took his hand in his, and he said, is that OK? And his son said, dad's fine. He said, dad's fine, Pete. He's, he's recovering. He finally had that eye surgery. So, the old guy had had failing eyes for years. His doctor had tried to convince him, persuade him for years to have a simple procedure that he knew would dramatically improve his vision. A vistrectomy to repair the vistrous nerve. But he couldn't get the old coot to do it. Finally, he relented. So as the son is retelling the story to Pete, he says to Pete, he says, well, Pete, you know, Dad's hearing wasn't all too good either. You see where this is going? <laughs> so he said he went home, and he said, Ma, pack a bag. We got to go down to Boston. Got to go to Mass Ionia. They're going to give me a vasectomy. <laughs> Beat the hell out of me, but they say it's going to make me see better. <laughs> and it did. Well, as we were getting off the phone, Pete says to me, hey, he said, Teddy, Teddy, tit for tat. Tell me your favorite main story. And I thought for a minute, and I said, I said, Pete, this goes right to our favorite mainer idiosyncrasy of not liking to talk to people from away. He said, well, tell me. All right. So the summer that I was 20 years old, I was working a job in Bar Harbor, Maine, Bar Harbor, with a buddy of mine. And one day, we had the day off. And a friend of ours who we worked with had a car. But she had to work that day. But she said, you guys want to use the car? We said, tja. So we borrowed the car. It was hot. It was a hot August day. You know those days by the water when it's like there's no breeze. It doesn't matter. You're by the water. It's almost more humid. It's like that. And the car broke down. But before we ever got to the causeway to get off the island. Right? So we had to bring the car back the other way, because we weren't going to push it all the way over the causeway. That was another 13 miles. So we started pushing the car south back toward Solmesville, where we knew there was a gas station. At least we thought we did. So we're pushing the car. I mean, miles. And this is, I don't remember what year that was, but I can assure you, this was no Prius. It was like a Ford Fairlane. You know, It was like a boat. And we're pushing the car. And there's hills. So every so often, one of us has to get in the car to ride the brake. And we're pushing and pushing and pushing. Finally, we see this sign. It says, gas station, one mile. So we keep pushing. We push a little further. And this little white frame house hoves into view. Little white frame house. And then we get a little closer. We can see there's a little old Mainer sitting on the porch of his white frame house with like a collie or something at his feet. It looked like something out of Edward Hopper. And I don't know what he thought, because we were like, our shirts were off. We're like drenched in sweat. We're panting. We look like we've just. So I said, excuse me, sir. Do you know, is there a, a mechanic at that gas station up ahead? And he said, yes, sir. 
And I said, thank you. And we started pushing the car again. I don't think we went maybe 10 feet, and I heard a little voice behind me. You won't find them there today, though. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Maynard. Because, no, because I understand, you know, it's like they don't, he didn't know me. I looked like, I don't know what. So that's all right. We pushed the car there. We left a little note under the windshield wiper, what we auto diagnosticians that we weren't thought the problem was. And we came back bright and early the next morning. Got there about 7 o'clock. And we got there, and the car was no longer in front of the gas station. So we thought, oh, God, either somebody's stolen it, or, and then we heard, like, some banging around inside. So I thought, well, this is good. So we went in, and there's somebody, sure enough, banging around under the car. And I said, hello, excuse me, hello. Finally, a little head comes out from under the hood, and we recognize them right away, our friend from the porch. <laughs> this is why he knew that the mechanic wasn't there. <laughs> and he was under no compulsion, he realized, and I can't disagree, to share the details of his work schedule with a perfect neighbor. It's not what Mainers do. So he figured out what it was. It was nothing that we thought it was. He had the thing fixed in like five minutes. He brought the car down off the lift. He turned to us, he's wiping up his hands, and said, you boys have breakfast yet? We said, no. Follow me. He kicked the back door open. There was like this beat up white refrigerator there. And he kicked that door open, and it opened up. And he took out three cold Paps Blue Ribbons, and <laughs> all was good. You know, as I finish, as I finish, I do want to share one thing with you. I want to share one thing with you about community. Because that is, I think, the quality that is central for me in all my travels around New England. Um, how many of you are familiar with the, the concept of the third place in American life? Anybody? So there's a wonderful American. I, I'm, 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 I'm going to finish up right now. But I love sharing this because it really goes to the heart of, I think, what makes New England such a special place. And I love to share it. And uh, there is a wonderful American sociologist named Ray Oldenburg. University of Florida in the late 70s. He came up with a wonderful theory. And he called it the theory of the third place. Because he found in his research that even though we as Americans may think that we are incredibly mobile and free and we travel all over, he found that nonetheless, the majority of our lives are spent in just one of three places. Yes, that doesn't include cruise. But essentially, day-to-day -day wise, just one of three places. The first place, which you can probably guess, home, family. The second place, work. The third place was what he theorized about, and it's brilliant. The third place, he said, is not one particular place. It can be one of a number of types of places. It can be a place of worship. It can be a place where you get your hair done. It can be a diner where you run in for a cup of coffee. It can be a public library. May the Lord bless them and keep them. It can be a general store, which is what I researched and wrote about most recently. But the third place in American life, he found, is unique because it does something that we need, whether we know it or not. The third place is a place where, yes, you go to do a defined task, Pray, get your hair done, return a book, get a carton of eggs, return a book, whatever. But when you go to the third place in American life, a third place, you have an expectation that you will not be alone. Moreover, it's important who you think you will run into. You have an expectation you will run into people you may know, people from your community. And he found that Americans need this. We all need this. The problem and the reason why he decided to do his study and his research was because at that point in the 70s, and sadly, it's, it's continued, American communities were fracturing, right? I mean, these things that drew people together, where people would come together, yes, they still exist in many smaller towns, but they were beginning to be lost. And this theory of the third place was all about my most recent book about general stores, but it says everything about what makes New England such a, such a special place. Pierce's in North Shrewsbury, Vermont, closed in 1993. Because Marjorie Pierce, who at that point was the end of a 
second of 65, Pierce's, 65 years of Pierce's owning it, couldn't do it anymore. She was in her early 90s. And she consulted one of my very favorite New Englanders, Dr. Fred Tuttle, Paul Brune, who is the creator of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And she worked with Paul. And they were able to put together a group of people, like my friend Sally Deinzer. And they were able to put together a group of people who were able to come together as a community and save the store. They completely rehabbed the store. It looks exactly like that today. I sat in that red chair for the third time in my life last, last fall. And they were able to reopen the store in 2009. There was some belly aching. They had to raise $64,000, which in a town of 939 people is a lot of money. But they raised it. And right before they reopened it, they asked for another $2,500 for an emergency generator. And there was a lot of belly aching. A lot of people felt like that's a lot of money. Marjorie Pierce never needed an emergency generator. But they got it because they felt that we are going to be a true third place. If we are going to be a community gathering place through thick and thin, we need the community to know that we will be here through thick and thin. So they got the emergency generator. They reopened in 2009, and it was wonderful. The heart and soul of North Shrewsbury, Vermont, was beating once again. And then two years later, Hurricane Irene. And ironically, they found it wasn't the worst of the Vermont winter that was thrown at them, but oddly, the worst of a Vermont August. Hurricane Irene, which had been downgraded to a tropical storm, but <laughs> what difference does it make? It was still packing over 65 mile an hour winds. And it took away 200 year old bridges all over Vermont. You may recall the power went out all over Vermont, including North Shrewsbury, Vermont, except one little place. This is late afternoon on the day Irene hit. And the folks who are now running the store trudged over through the howling wind and the flying debris. They fired up the emergency generator. The lights came on. To hear them tell it, they say it looked like something out of Dawn of the Living Dead. Because they said, late afternoon there, when the lights came on, they would see people coming up out of the trees. <laughs> and they got there, and the lights were on, and the coffee was hot, and the Wi-Fi, and the phones were working. People were able to call relatives and let them know they were OK. And nobody has ever belly ached about that emergency generator again. And that, to me, really sums up the kind of determination and spirit of community that makes New England such a special place. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can I take some questions? Yeah. So what we're going to do is have a few questions. We want to have time to allow Ted to sell us some books. So yes, we, we do want to allow time and for that. And then you get to meet him, autograph it. I just want to thank one very special person here, Ashley. Yes. Could you stand for a moment? Come on. Ashley is our amazing activity director, coordinator, whatever your real title is. She comes up with all these amazing ideas. She puts them in place. Like this past Sunday, our last speaker, um, Bill Elliott. I was going to do Ted Elliott because I'm thinking. <laughs> um, and he was the one who orchestrated American in Paris. And he met them in Providence for the show, and Ashley organized that. She does so many amazing events. You'll see them in the newsletter. So I just really want to say thank you for thank this. You. Okay. So and yeah, if anybody uh, has a question or two, uh, no pressure. But I, I'm happy to answer a question or two if anybody, anybody has one. What mill towns do I like? OK. So one of my favorite mill towns in Massachusetts is North Adams. That's a great example of how a former mill town has tried to reimagine itself. Anybody been to Mass Mocha? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever stayed at the porches? No, that's a great, that's a great, that's former worker housing, you know. And they made a wonderful hotel out of it. But uh, North Adams is a great example of for me. And of course, I love Lawrence and Lowell. Um, I actually did. My dad uh, was a wonderful amateur photographer. And you know, we weren't always so close. But you know, we had a wonderful experience where 
he said to me once, why don't I, he knew that I liked to write, and he said, why don't we go to Lawrence and Lowell, and I'll take pictures, and you can write about what we're seeing. And it's really one of, one of the most special experiences I ever had with my dad. But that was because of what we saw in Lawrence and Lowell. Uh, you know, I was much younger, and I didn't really know so much about the history. Um, read more about that later. But there is, uh, you know, Lawrence and Lowell, they're very special places, mill towns. You know, um, they're places where everyday people um, really worked in often unspeakable conditions. And yet, they were all just trying to make themselves a better life. You know, they were frequently immigrants. They frequently didn't speak the language of other people in whatever town they were in. And um, I always sort of, I love, whenever stories I've done, especially in where there are mill buildings, whether it's, you know, Lawrence or Lowell or Amiskeag or, 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 or Woonsocket or wherever, Haverhill, I, I love to be able to find still vacant mill buildings. Because, you know, if you ever have an opportunity to do that, you can almost sort of feel the ghosts of all this work that went on. Um, I love the photographer Lewis Hind. Do you know anybody know his photography? Right. You know there is one of the most haunting photographs that I've ever seen, and it's one of Hind's. And maybe some of you have seen that. It's a very famous photograph, but it speaks to that. You know, which is that photograph. It was in Manchester. I believe it was the Contacook Mills in Manchester, New Hampshire. But it is taken from the perspective behind a young girl. She's not more than nine or 10 years old. And she's at a bobbin machine. And you, you, she's staring out the window. And through the window, you see some gentlemen playing golf down below on a golf course. And it, it was one of those photographs of Heinz that really helped foment the kind of movement that eventually eradicated child labor. So um, thank you for asking. Thank you for asking that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? So if there are no other questions, um, yes, I am going to plant myself over here. Uh, if you, seriously, if anybody would like to purchase a book, I have all three of my books there. Uh, we've talked about doing a notebook in which Fred Tuttle and Lynn Donahue are part of that book. But I also have my, my second book, Wicked Pissed, which is all about New England's most famous feuds. And I have my newest book about New England's general stores, which I alluded to at the end there. So if you'd like to purchase one, I would be delighted to personally sign one for you at no extra charge. And um, whether you buy a book or not, I also have at this end of the table right here, I have a sign-up sheet. If you'd like to give me your email address, there is a 50, 50 that is for my, um, my mailing list. If you'd like to give me your email address, there's a 50-50 chance you'll never hear from me again. But uh, I'm trying to do better at that, but I'm just telling you. Anyway, I want to thank you very much again. And I want to thank Ash also, because you, we've been pen pals for about nine, eight, ten months now. Was it last summer when you first invited me to come? Yes, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you.